Good morning, CLC family. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this service. We are so happy that you are here, loving yourself just the way you are. And with that, in this moment, I invite you during our inner healing time to just take a few deep breaths. Center your body. Calm your mind. In this moment, just put everything aside for now. Take another nice, deep breath. Filling your lungs with cool, calming air. And on that out breath, release all that no longer serves you. All the stress and tension. Just let it go for now. It'll be there. And allow yourself to be here now. Universal love enfolds me. Universal wisdom inspires me. Universal spirit enlightens me. Universal power encircles me. I am one and all is well. As we begin this inner healing process, let me invite you to relax in quiet confidence, opening yourself to the miracle working higher power. Now symbolize the unity of your thinking and feeling nature by touching your chest with your right hand and let my words act as your own for your own inner healing, acceptance, and receptivity. I acknowledge that there is a power, intelligence, and wisdom greater than my own. I am in the midst of it, and it is in the midst of me, sensitive and responsive to my every thought, word, action, and feeling. I now make this true for myself by saying aloud, I acknowledge. Acknowledging this higher power working through my life, I admit that I am personally responsible for solving my own problems while being guided and assisted by something greater than myself. As I am ready to surrender the conflicts of my ego to the wisdom of this infinite presence, I simply speak these words, I surrender. Knowing that forgiveness is the key to unconditional love and the feeling of heaven, I now unconditionally forgive anyone and everyone who has ever injured me in any way, real or imagined. And I now forgive myself for all of my mistaken judgments and their resulting actions. From my deepest level of understanding, I now say, I forgive. Realizing that I continually experience the effects of my own thinking, I now choose to allow this higher power to recreate me deeply, filling my mind with thoughts that are only positive, constructive, loving, and beautiful. I call upon this divine inflow by stating aloud, I choose. I now center upon that one special idea that I'm willing to accept as real for me in this coming week. In visualizing that idea as already acted upon and brought to pass, in seeing my idea become a fact of my experience, I enjoy the happiness and peace of my thought fulfilled 
and gratefully speak these words. I accept. Knowing that I have an everlasting place in the midst of the power that sustains all creation, as well as the support of all those around me, I allow myself to relax in the peace of fulfillment and gratitude and say, I release. Now, in my mind's eye, I envision the presence of someone near and dear to me. This can be a friend, a family member, a teacher or a mentor, someone who has touched my life in deep and loving ways. Someone who may not be physically present in the room with me this morning. I turn toward that image in my mind's eye and say, I'm grateful for the good in your life. Now I open my eyes, turn to the world around me, and joyfully speak to anyone physically present in the room or virtually on this broadcast and share in confidence and gratitude and saying, I'm grateful for the good in your life. My name is Jennings. This is the Science of Mind. Welcome to Creative Life Spiritual Center. This is a series by request. I do take requests. You have to write them on a cocktail napkin and wrap them around some money and pass them to the front. And I'll <laughs> take your request. <laughs> but somebody asked four or five months ago for a series on the hero's journey. So that's what we're starting out today. The heroic journey. It's not gender specific. It's the heroic journey. And we have many of these things. So what we're going to do this month, just so you know, you're not caught by surprise. I'm going to speak, uh, give you a couple of the stages of the thing today maybe two and a half, pick up next week, then the week after that's Easter, and it fits perfectly into where we'll be on the journey at that point. And the final Sunday this month, our soon-to-be-ordained Reverend Lisa Ryan will speak, and she will bring you home. We're counting on her to do that, or I'll come back the following week, and we'll all still be wandering around in the, in the mythological forest, but she's, she's going to bring us all home in the journey. So... Here's the thing. You know the saying, no justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. How often we hear that is in the context of social justice, social issues. What it's saying is that we, the people, will not settle down and become complacent and lower our voices until there's a representation of justice in our community, until it's really been, things have really been Resolved. I want to add another layer of meaning to that that in no way crowds out that first layer of meaning. But the same is true because if we are, all of us as individuals, projecting our consciousness into the community, then the same dynamic is true within the self. No justice, no peace. If I'm not getting what I need, if I feel like I'm losing what I have, okay, that's not just in me, and I have no peace. And peace is not simply the absence of conflict. Tra Dr. Tracy Brown points this out beautifully. Okay? It's not simply that everything is settled down. It's like you can have a family that's in turmoil even if the police aren't called. Right? You can have a situation that's in great upset even if nobody outside of that situation recognizes it. People individually struggle and we face them every day and they look fine. They seem fine at work. They seem fine in the checkout line at the grocery store. Sometimes not so fine behind the wheel because uh, you have a certain anonymity there, you know, that, uh, that you don't have in a, in a pedestrian environment. But People hold a lot in until and unless they either explode or redeem, heal themselves in some way, are healed in some way, come to some kind of reconciliation with life. That's what this is about, this he heroic journey. It's, it's not simply about mythological questing. It's not simply about what what you might think it's about in the sense of somebody's going to come and get you and take you off on some big pirate adventure, you know. 
It's not a theme park thing. All of this happens within the self. The heroic journey happens within the self. Now, it may also happen that you're called out of your environment of um, kind of sedentary nature, and you're called out into the world to act and to move. That may also happen, but it's not absolutely necessary that it happen. What is definitely going to happen is, is a transit within consciousness within consciousness. So here we go. The, it starts with the call to adventure. The heroic journey is what's known as a monomyth. A monomyth, okay? There are myths, which are stories, about this, that, and the other thing. You and I grew up with a lot of them. There's the myth of the flood. There's the myth of the dispersion in the Tower of Babel story. There's the myth of the rainbow that covers the earth that is a signal of God's covenant with humankind that never again will everyone be destroyed, and on and on. And that's just the biblical stories that you and I are familiar with. From every culture, there are myths. And they all converge into a monomyth. They all converge into one central story, which is the progression of understanding within the individual about where they came from, why they're here, what the meaning of their life is, and what is their destiny, their self-created destiny. Okay? And so all the other stories all are elaborations on this one story. They're like rivulets that run to the stream that runs to the ocean. It's all about the unfoldment of the self. Every spiritual tradition is. And what Jeffrey was alluding to in that book, which sounds fascinating, I'm wondering if that's one of those individuals writes for Science Mind magazine, I think, Mark Waldman, um, where he's saying it doesn't matter what you worship, it doesn't matter what your understanding of God is, the power of faith is so strong. And this is true, and this is why we have symbols of, of world faith traditions on the wall in here. Pick you one. Or pick you several. You know? Uh, you want a fun adventure? Pick you several. You have no idea what they mean. Lift the thing up and see. See what's behind it. And it'll be, as I often say, a corridor into understanding. A corridor into the experience of the divine. Not simply the conversation about the divine, but the experience of the divine. Pick you a path. And every path will lead you to the same threshold, and every threshold will present the same daunting face. Are you willing? Are you willing? Are you willing to go within and look at yourself and be honest with yourself? Are you willing to do that? And if you're not, <laughs> you know what the threshold says? Come back when you are. <laughs> Just come back when you are. Then go away and do whatever it is you need to do and return when you are. So the call to adventure is the call to self-discovery. And one way that it occurs is by the figurative knock on the door. Now, again, if you're familiar with like fantasy literature and stuff, there's an actual knock on the door. Or there's a little kid living in a space under the stairs. Or you know all of these stories. Your favorite stories. Some of, some of my, one of my favorite series is, the, is the, uh, His Dark Materials, the uh, Philip Pullman stuff. I just love that. I just love that. It's, it's, it's so rich. It's so rich. And it's also contemporary enough that I don't have to like learn Elvish or something. You know, it's not a whole different language, a whole different thing. It's like right here. Anyway, there's a figurative knock on the door of ordinary waking reality. We're sitting there and typically we're filled with opinions. We have an understanding of things. We are clever beings. And we go through stages of this, you know, where we feel we're more clever than, than uh, at other times, uh, typically at thresholds of, of age. Uh, in our teenage years, we know everything. Then in our 20s, we forget a little. And in our 30s, we're back at it. And it, it runs in cycles, you know, where uh, you you feel competent, you feel confident inside your life, and sometimes overconfident, and sometimes like nothing can surprise me. Now, I've seen it all. You ever had a person way younger than you kind of have take that attitude, you know, I've seen everything, you can't surprise me in this world. And you're like, really? Okay, well, so we get prideful. 
We get prideful. We get stuck inside our own opinions. And we sit in the house with these. We sit around the house with our own opinion of reality. And there's a knock on the door, which invites us to recognize that everything we thought was true may or may not be, but has no real evidence to it that that we must go find. For example, we sit around and we believe, oh, love is the answer and love is, and we sing songs about love and we write poems about love and it's like, well, there's a way to love in this world that not any of us has discovered yet. There's a way to open our hearts in compassion because the situation has not presented itself. You might say to yourself, well, now, if I were in that situation, here's how I would feel about it, but you haven't been in that situation, so you don't really know how you feel about it until you are in that situation. Have you, for example, ever been with somebody when they died? When they actually expired out of this world? And I know some of you have, and I know some of you do that by way of work and your, your volunteer engagement. But until you've done that, until you've actually been physically present with someone as their immortal soul left their body, it's an experience you can only imagine how you would handle. Well, when the call comes, the call is there to bring you into experiences that you've not had for the purpose of discovering more about yourself. And it will pull you out of yourself. It will pull you out of yourself to take you on this particular journey of discovery. So again, we sit inside the comfortable home or, as it was represented in ancient versions of the monomyth, a cave. Or... The womb, the figurative womb. And something says, all right, your help is needed. Now, here's the thing about the call to adventure. When it comes, it doesn't tell you you're kind of foolish. There's more you should learn, okay? Because nobody's going to follow a call like that, right? We're all going to kind of take umbrage. That I'm not foolish. I know that. We really kind of are, and more on that in a moment. But the call is going to come in the sense of, I need your help. I need your help. Something will say, I need your help. Okay? And that, there's just enough ego stroke in there that we get interested. Oh, you need my help. Oh, well, of course. You need my help because I'm so clever, and I know all these things and this, you know. So I'm inclined to go with you, except I'm very comfortable where I am. So there is a bit of a refusal, or at least a hesitation, in terms of going. Now, I want to add another layer of stuff on here, which I think Lisa will parse for you in her week, too, about the tarot. The tarot. Hold everything I said off to one side for a moment. We'll come back to it. Trust me, we will. We won't let you out of here until we do. Okay? No kibble, no food, no coffee till we do. So... In the tarot deck, there's what's called the major arcana, and it's representative, representative of states of consciousness. And there's a whole long backstory there, which we'll do some other time, or we'll have a workshop on, or whatever, about where it came from and what exactly each of these things represents. But the principal character, to me, in the major arcana is the card numbered zero, and it represents the fool. The fool is the participant in everything that the major arcana unfolds, if you will. The fool goes on the journey and becomes some of the other characters and interacts with some of the other characters. And the fool is typically represented, and there are a gazillion different tarot decks out there with different artistic representation, but like the Rider Waite and the, the kind of the classical representation of the fool is it's a young person with, uh, with a satchel on a stick, like in the old cartoons when a kid was running away from home, they'd have this like bag hanging on a stick over their shoulder, right? Okay. And a puppy down here, knee, knee high, and, and the, the young person is looking up at the clouds on a beautiful blue sky day and about to step off a cliff. Okay. Well, that's you. Man, and that's me. That's we. We are that character. If we're honest with ourselves, every moment of every day, we're stepping into the unknown. 
Uh, but at a certain stage, you aren't aware of that so much. And you think you have it all figured out. And you've got the journey all planned. And you've got your dog with you. And, you know, off you go. Well, the fool is the teachable one. The fool, you know, it's like when Jesus talked about the, uh, the uh, meek. Blessed are the meek in the Beatitudes, in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the meek. And so everybody read. now this has been through many translations, but everybody reading that, they thought then I should be meek. And everybody wanted to get kind of meek, and, which meant kind of, kind of mealy mouth and kind of me, 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 you know, just kind of sheepish. And stuff. That's not what it means. It means teachable. It means receptive. It means you move your opinions aside in order to take on this new idea of how things could possibly be. So we all start out as the fool on the journey. We don't know. Sometimes the fool is blindfolded. That's pressing the metaphor even more. Your senses are cut off or your senses are useless. And actually at a given point in consciousness, your senses are useless. Because it doesn't matter how beautiful a day it is outside. It matters how beautiful a day you experience it as being outside. And where do you experience that? But in your mind. Not in your eyes, not in your ears, not in the physical senses. They register information and take it in. But it's the mind that interprets and evaluates, right? Have you ever had people say to you, cheer up, it's a beautiful day. And you're like, what does that possibly have to do with anything? That it's a beautiful day. And what they're meaning is that when they see it, they interpret it a certain way and they assume you should do the same thing. People try to be helpful that way to others. And it's mostly annoying, but you see <laughs> that it's, right? It's all a matter of consciousness. So the call comes and it says, I need your help. And here's the thing, we get all kind of, it's an egotistical thing, and it's like, you need my help, that's great, yeah, sure, I can fix, I can fix anything, you know. But what you come to find out real shortly is that the help they need from you, the help that this person, this being, this entity has called for, is help that you don't know how to provide. You have no idea where to find this in yourself. And that really is the purpose of the quest, is for you to uncover it. Now, I got a tiny bit more for you. I don't want to give the whole thing away in one fell swoop. And it's, and it's a lot, not to sound at all um, patronizing, but it's a lot of information to digest if you're hearing this for the first time. So the call comes, that's step one. The refusal of the call is step two. Refusal slash hesitation. Wait, you want me to do what? I don't know how to do that. You remember Bilbo Baggins? He's a good example of this, okay, in The Hobbit. Bilbo Baggins, comfortable little person, lives in a little hole in the you know, hill, nice little house, with a brown door and all this, has a routine, has a serious routine, is doing stuff all the time that he's done for, because he's 111, what do they call it, 1111 or something when it comes to the, to the second version, the uh, Lord of the Rings, where his nephew, you know. So he's 111 then, and uh, so he's around 100, I guess, when, when the Hobbit story unfolds. So in 100 years, he's done the same thing, and his people did the same thing, and they garden, and they live in the Shire, and all the rest of this, and so he is really comfortable, and he's only met this wizard a few times before, I'm not sure where, fundraisers probably. <laughs> <laughs> cocktail parties, I don't know, and there's a knock at the door and there's a nine-foot wizard standing there and I think he was nine feet uh, dressed in a purple, long flowing purple robe who says to him, I, we need you to come with us and he's got a bunch of other various beings with him, you know, and uh, we leave tomorrow and uh, we have to go restore someone to a throne and we have to go retake a treasure from a dragon and we ha and Bilbo is like are you out of your mind this is I, I am not I am not your guy uh, at all well that's what we say you see inside it's like hey you know I'm doing the best I can here and 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 this this journey calls us and says now there's a part of you you're about to discover 
You're stronger than you thought. You're braver than you thought. You're smarter than you thought. You're more connected than you thought. But you're not thinking. You're not thinking. So it's time to experience. It's time to experience and then evaluate after the experience. So again, typically, second step, we refuse the call. We waver in the call. We, we don't go. And what convinces us to go, and the next part of this is what I'm going to dwell on next week, but what convinces us to go is the promise of the mentor, the promise of our wise leader who says, you can trust me. Would I put you in any kind of danger? <laughs> Maniacal laugh here, okay? <laughs> would, would I? <laughs> I'll be with you every step of the way. And I'm big and powerful and wise and blah, blah, blah. And so you start thinking, Meh, what have I got to lose? Plus, what great stories I'll have when I get back. People will admire me, look up to me, and, and, you know, give me the respect I haven't otherwise gotten because I've traveled on these journeys. It's like I'll have, you know how people on their luggage sometimes, they put stickers for all the places they've been, you know, or, or on RVs you'll see this too, you know. And so I'll be able to show people, you know, see, I'm a, I'm a widely traveled individual. So the ego gets going here, and the mentor the figure that Plato called our demon, D-A-E-M-O-N, who is a being like, sort of like an angelic being, a being that exists between the overarching deity and other mortal humans. Our higher self is how some characterize it. The mentor is our higher self. Comes and gets us and says, I will accompany you every step of the way. Now, how we hear that is that this higher self will take all incoming danger onto its, it will step between us and trouble. It hasn't actually said that, but that's how we interpret things. Have you ever had a relationship like that? You ever had a friend like that? Where you thought, well, by hanging out with this person, like maybe when you were a little kid on the playground in school, you think, by hanging out with this person, I'll never get beat up. Because I'll just push them out there in the way of trouble, and they'll take care of everything. They haven't actually promised that they would do that. But they're bigger than we are, or older than we are, or something, and so it looks, it looks kind of likely. Um, sometimes you find in relationships will say, well, you're the emotional one, so any kind of emotional turmoil or anything, you handle it, okay? Uh, you feel for both of us. That's kind of what gets put on the mentor. We're in for a surprise. The mentor leads us to a threshold. We've crossed now two, or we're about to cross the second, the first being our own doorway. Now we're led to a second threshold of an unknown entrance. You know what the unknown entrance is? It's a cave, just like the house we were in is representative of a cave. Only we know that cave. We know where the light switches are. In this cave, we don't know. We don't know where we're going, or, or is it cold? Is it wet? Do, are we packed for the trip? Will I be inconvenienced at all? Will, will there be restrooms? Will there be um, a buffet, perhaps? Uh, at, at various points. Uh, what exactly am I letting myself in for here? And so, we come to this stage of the journey where I'm going to leave us for today. But with this, this that I'm describing happens to everyone. This is not at all, at all, simply a function of being a student of science of mind or new thought, or metaphysics, or advanced living, or whatever you want to call this that we pat ourselves on the back for being a part of because it's all so evolved and stuff, you know. Everybody does this. Everybody does this regardless of any spiritual affiliation they might have or have ever had. 
because every being who incarnates here has one job, one job, first of all, know thyself. Know thyself. You may disagree. You may say, no, our job here is to give and receive unconditional love. I defy anyone to do that who does not know themselves. Otherwise, we come into it in extracting from the world what we think the world has for us that we lack and then running off with it. <laughs> Look what I got away with. Look what I, I came out of this experience feeling loved and I don't deserve it, so I got away with it. And you know what that turns you into? Just as I make my hands like this, my voice changes. You know what I'm thinking? You know, I know what you're thinking. The precious, the precious. Gollum, the twisted little character who used to be like everybody else until it fell in love with gold and got away with something, found something it knew it shouldn't have and it should have returned it or called, turned it into the office or something. <laughs> the lost and found. And, and, it's, and it's this constantly through the whole body of work and those stories, it's looking over its shoulder, right? It's got this kind of crouching sort of thing going on, you know, just kind of twisted little self. And, uh, well, that's, that's how we feel when we think we've gotten away with something. Like, I've, wow, you, ha, you fell for it, <laughs> you know? You love me. I don't deserve it. I know I don't deserve it. You probably know I don't deserve it, but you gave it to me anyway. And so I got away with something here, and I, like, pulled a fast one on the universe. And we run through our lives this way. That's, so that's why I say... All, all of the hearts and flowers, as pretty as it is about giving and receiving unconditional love, and it is absolutely true, and it's absolutely, you know, real. And it, it's an effect. Love is our nature, but it's an effect of having our nature be in alignment, where thoughts and feelings are in alignment. And now I know who I am. Have you ever, I, you know, I could go on for a long time with this, but it's like, have you ever been in a conversation with somebody where you feel like they're really not hearing what I'm saying. They're, they're, they're like so involved in their own process of, of trying to impress me back or what they're going to say next or something like this. They're all caught up in their own issue. Or have I been that person? Have I been that person? Yeah, we all have and there's no shame in it. The point is to come awake and to realize this and to realize this. So when we say no justice, no peace, when we say I wish there were peace in Ukraine today, and I wish there were, well, peace is preceded by certain things, okay? which is a cessation not only of hostilities, but of tension, but of tension, where I'm not just, you're not just not invading me, I'm not expecting you to invade me. We have a conversation going on. We have a relationship that's healthy and open, and this is what we're seeking to establish in the world. This is the larger reason why we go on the heroic journey. It's not just to benefit ourselves and land a new job and win friends and influence people. Okay? It's about building a better world. This is how we repair creation, one at a time. And every now and then, somebody who's new to this teaching will say, well, it seems real self-absorbed to me to do all of this inner spiritual work when we live in a struggling world. And once again, because I'm real familiar with that question and had it myself when I first came into this, we pick up the story with, well, if my world's not working, how's that one supposed to? I've got to know who I am. I've got to know who I am and resolve things resolve things. So before the talk, I asked Jeffrey, I said, play a chord, would you? And resolve it. He's going to resolve, what is this, a seventh? He's going to resolve into a full octave. See, if he just, if he just lingered, linger for a moment on the seventh, would you? It'd be like, okay, okay, and, right? You hear that? It's like, drop the other shoe. Finish the thing. Take it up a step, right? And now, oh, that's beautiful. See, he's, he's resolved it upward. That's the transformation that occurs within the self. As we resolve things, it doesn't mean they go away. It means they complete themselves. The circle is completed within. So I've left you about a third of the way around the circle clockwise. You're to, 
you know, two, three o'clock uh, as we go today. And next week we'll pick it up. So I'll do one of these things. Last week at Creative Life, we were left on the threshold. Today, today, next week, we'll step into the dark. We'll step into the dark and see what we find there. And I think you'll really enjoy it. All right, let's know together now there is one life, one power, one presence, pure spirit, everywhere manifesting. And yes, indeed, it sure did make a pretty day. And it's funny how we tweak these days. We look at it and we say, well, it could be cooler or it could be this could be greener, could be like we have a perfect ideal of our perfect day. That's how powerful consciousness is, as we relate things to a state of knowing within. And we're just really not satisfied until everything matches up. So I came to this earth and you came to this earth to live among other godlings who thrive, who are happy with each other who are in love with each other, so that the whole earth might break out into song. And we run to each other with our creative projects, and we say, look, look what I did, and what are you doing, and how can we collaborate on this, and let's bring in some others and have a whole cohort of creativity. That's what we came here to do, and we're not satisfied until we have it. And we keep waiting for others to change, the world to change, so that it might reflect that which we hope for inside. And soon we discover that's not how it works. That's not how it works. We come to the place of falling in love with the world that it, as it is, so that it is free to change. So that it is free to change. So that we feel empowered. So that we feel strengthened. So that we feel supplied being exactly who we are in this world. And that way we speak the truth to one another. And that way we have no attack intention toward anyone else. And that way we have a just and true and real experience of each other in this world. And we are one more place where peace has actually happened that is now free to spread. So I affirm and know that this heroic journey that has come for each of us, and I know that it has, and I know that it has at this time, else you would not be hearing these words, that this journey is useful, successful, intriguing, somewhat disturbing, and entirely worthwhile. And for this knowing, and the way that it manifests in the life of everyone experiencing this time together today, I say thank you, infinite presence of life, Mother, Father, God, that this is so, and so it is. So, Mary and I are going to play a little arrangement by Anna Jenkins on the state anthem of Ukraine, and then we'll follow it with later, uh, The Water is Wide, we'll be doing also.
Thank you, Jeffrey and Mary. That was absolutely beautiful. And as our ushers make their way to the back, I just want to ask, is there anyone here for the first time? Even though I know the answer to that. Please raise your hand. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Jeffrey has some wonderful friends that join us today, so we're grateful that they are here, and we hope that they can join us again. If you are online with us for the first time, please let us know. You can message us on Facebook Messenger. You can send it on chat right now, or you can always email us at info at creativelife.org. And now we come to giving time. Thank you, everyone, for being here yet again, if this is not your first time being in the audience. Thank you for the gift of your presence, of your love, of all of your monetary donations. We are grateful that you give to this center. We hope that you continue to because if it's not for you, we wouldn't be here. So thank you, everyone. And I ask you to join me now in saying, divine love through me blesses and multiplies all the good I am and have, all the good I give and receive. I am prosperous now, and so it is. static electricity. Didn't shock myself when I picked up the microphone. All right. Um, so in the Tarot, the major arcana, it's 21. I was trying to see how many steps were necessary for the heroic journey. Because um, in the Tarot, the 21 cards, some of them are people, not just tasks. So I'm like, somewhere between 9 and 12. So we'll see. I see why he said we're a third of the way through, nine or 12. So what are we going to treat for today? Well, you've been called. Maybe you're ready to refuse. Or maybe you're standing at that cave mouth going, is this really what I want? Trust me, it is. I've been on a 10-year journey. <laughs> and... Now it's a lifetime. <laughs> That's what ordination means, lifetime. So, and you don't come back the same way you went in. So take a deep breath with me and know that there is one life, one power, one presence. 
It's all the life there is. And we partake in that life. That life is our life now. We are living that life. And the question is, not why are we living that life, but what are we doing with it? So in the unenfoldment of self, in the growing in love, in the knowing of springtime, I know for you courage. I know for you companions. I know for you mentors. I know for you answers. And more importantly, I know for you questions. questions that only you can answer. But the good news is there is divine guidance. So I am knowing of the opening, the unfolding of the heart into the divine wisdom so that all of the questions may be answered and new ones formed. The way we make a world that works for everyone is to find the questions, to live the questions, to be the questions, and the love. And I am grateful for a teaching that sets us on this path with the full knowledge that we will be a different person when we get to the crossroads where we can choose a new path. So I am grateful for this teaching. I am grateful for this place. I am grateful for these people. I am grateful for all of the little bits and pieces that come together to make this what it is. Our senior minister, our staff ministers, our practitioners, our musicians, and you. And I release knowing it is so, and so it is. And so it is. Say with me now, something wonderful is happening through me. Something wonderful is happening through me. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in everything I am. I feel it in everything I am. I choose it. I choose it. I trust it. I trust it. I use it. I use it. And I love it. And I so love it. it is. And so it is.